Disclosures for this and all episodes in this series can be found on the podcast series destination page located on education.webmd.com. The following presentation is copyrighted by WebMD Education. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of WebMD Education. The following podcast is supported by an independent educational grant from Moderna. Hello, my name is Dr. Greg Poland. I'm a professor of medicine and director of the Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group and the editor-in-chief of the journal Vaccine. Welcome to this podcast episode entitled, What Happens If Adults Get RSV? This is part of the six-episode podcast series called, What to Know About COVID-19, the Flu, and RSV. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Ann Falsey. Dr. Falsey, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Well, hi, Craig. It's really nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, So I am a professor of medicine at the University of Rochester in the Infectious Disease Unit. I am an infectious disease clinician, and I also do research on respiratory viruses, actually primarily RSV in adults. That's great. We're very pleased to have you, Anne, with us because today we're going to be talking all things RSV. Just to kick things off, maybe it's helpful to remind everyone a little bit about viruses and particularly respiratory viral infections in general. A respiratory viral infection is a general term that we use for an infection in your respiratory system. That's your nose, your sinuses, throat, airways, and lungs. In this case, one caused by a virus. There are lots of different types of respiratory viral infections that are caused by different viruses. RSV, the infection that we're going to be talking about today, is caused by the respiratory syncytial virus. Another common respiratory infection is the common cold, which is often caused by a group of viruses called rhinoviruses. And of course, influenza, or what we call the flu, that's caused by many different strains of influenza viruses. As we are all aware, there is also COVID-19, which is caused by a coronavirus. It's important to note that while some of these infections can stay in your respiratory tract, there are others that start there and then affect other organs of the body. So Dr. Falsey, let's talk a little bit about what viruses actually are and what they do, and then we can get specifically into RSV. Sure, Greg, Um, you're absolutely right. We've been hearing a lot about viruses lately. So a virus is an extremely small organism. Um, Most are so small that they can only be seen with a very special kind of microscope. And they're also very common. In fact, viruses can be found pretty much everywhere on earth. Each virus has a core of what's called genetic material that is surrounded by a protective coat made of protein. But a virus doesn't have everything it needs to replicate to make more viruses on its own. So it needs to attach and then enter or infect the cells of the host, such as a human being. Um, And oftentimes, the virus can damage the cell uh, that it has infected during this infectious process. Right. And it's that damage that can be a real problem and lead to other complications and issues. So what do we know about RSV in particular and how it might affect someone? Well, RSV is a common virus that we've known about for decades that can cause infection in your nose, throat, sinuses, airways, and lungs. It's so common that most kids have gotten it before they turn two years old, Um, but anyone can get it really at any age and you can be reinfected uh, with RSV. Usually symptoms appear four to six days after you've been infected and most people will start with a mild cold-like symptom and recover on their own in just one to two weeks. But RSV can be serious and even life-threatening for some people. So some people that might be at higher risk for severe illness are those who have heart or lung conditions, people that have weakened immune systems from taking either certain medications or because of a certain health condition, older adults, especially those who are over 65, babies born prematurely, uh, babies who are less than 12 months of age or younger, 
and children that are living with certain health conditions who are having trouble swallowing and getting rid of mucus. So really, Anne, there's, there's a bit of a distinction here when we're looking at adults between those who are in average health and those who have some of the underlying health conditions that you mentioned or are older and more aged. We do know that for certain people, having an RSV infection can lead to serious complications, and some of those can be life-threatening. Some of those complications include just being sick enough that you have to be in the hospital bronchiolitis, which is an inflammation or swelling of the small airways in your lungs that makes it difficult to breathe, and lung infection, which we call pneumonia, which can be caused by a different virus or bacteria and can even happen as a result of the inflammation resulting from RSV infection. And then worsening of certain heart or lung conditions, including asthma, COPD, congestive heart failure, and certainly we see in babies and young children, middle ear infections. So Anne, what can you tell us about RSV symptoms if someone does become infected? Well, older children and healthy adults can often have mild symptoms as we just mentioned, that can really seem like a cold or a number of other mild respiratory infections. And some people may not have any symptoms at all, but that's actually quite unusual. Um, but when symptoms do appear, they often appear in stages and can include a dry cough and sneezing or a stuffy, runny nose, a sore throat, wheezing, maybe a lack of appetite, uh, a headache, and for some people, a fever, although fever is not usually a prominent symptom with RSV. But it's important to note that having RSV may not seem bad at first, but it can get worse after a few days. So with any symptoms, if you're, go you're gonna wanna talk to your doctor or your healthcare provider and get medical attention, if somebody's not drinking enough fluids or has trouble breathing and has a high fever or, or symptoms that are just getting worse. And you're, you're definitely right about RSV symptoms resembling those of other infections. They can be very similar to the symptoms of influenza and COVID-19, for example making it nearly impossible to distinguish which viral infection or infections they might have. So you can't really use symptoms to rule one infection in or the other one out or to help determine which infection you might have. So when you do have symptoms that are upper respiratory in nature, as Dr. Falsey said, you're gonna to wanna to contact your doctor or healthcare team as quickly as possible to protect your health and the health of your family there's testing that can be done to find out which virus is causing illness, including RSV, and that can be important. Knowing which one you have helps your doctor determine what next steps in your treatment and care. And it's also important to remember that viruses exist not just during the winter time, but year round. So while certain respiratory viral infections have a season when they're most common in the United States, the seasons for different viruses and infections can also overlap or happen at the same time. We've just been through a time period when we've talked about a tridemic because we've been seeing three respiratory viral infections, COVID-19, the flu, and RSV together. And getting one infection or getting sick and having your body be compromised can sometimes make it easier for you to get another infection as well, or what we call co-infection. And to make matters worse, you can have a co-infection caused by bacteria. And those are very different types of organisms that need to be treated very differently than viruses. So again, this goes back to, if you're having symptoms, you wanna contact your doctor or healthcare team so they can help determine what's causing your illness and appropriate next steps. So Anne, what can we tell people about how RSV is spread or transmitted? So like many other viruses, RSV can spread from person to person through the air. And when someone is uh, infected, they cough, they sneeze, and water droplets containing the virus can form and you can be exposed to these droplets, but it generally requires fairly close contact, say within three feet or so. And this is a common way that RSV can spread. But notably, the virus can also live for hours on objects and other surfaces, such as countertops, toys, phones, handles, and doorknobs. 
So RSV can spread through direct contact as well when you touch something that has the virus on it and then you touch your mouth, nose, or eyes. Uh, you're most likely to spread RSV during the first week of symptom or so after you're infected when you're having a lot of symptoms yourself. But infants and people who have weakened immune systems can continue to spread the virus for up to four weeks, even after their symptoms go away. This really drives home the point that you want to do everything you can to help keep yourself and those around you protected. And if you're one of those uh, groups who's at a higher risk for more severe illness, you want to be extra thoughtful about this. And this is important because we do want to try to keep people from getting sick and from getting sick enough that they need to be hospitalized. Because if you get that sick, your health, of course, is in danger. In addition, as we've seen over and over the last three years, there might not be enough room or staff at the hospital or urgent care to take care of you properly in this high infection time. And of course, there are a lot of other viruses and bacteria that circulate in the hospital. And so you wanna stay away from the hospital to protect yourself as well when you don't need to be there. So while we know that RSV season usually happens during the fall, winter, and spring months, the virus can and does exist year round. And as we mentioned, this overlaps with the season for other respiratory viral infections. So to just kind of review the ways you can help protect yourself and others and help prevent RSV from spreading, wash your hands well and often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when you cough or sneeze and throw away any used tissues. If you don't have a tissue, cough or sneeze into your elbow, not your hands. Keep surfaces and frequently touched objects clean. Avoid close contact such as kissing and sharing cups or eating utensils with others who are sick. And stay home from school or work if you're sick. How do we know these measures work to prevent infection? We saw very, very little influenza and RSV last year and the year before because people were taking these very precautions and wearing masks because of the COVID pandemic. And this helped lower the spread of all these different respiratory viral infections. But now that folks are easing off these precautions, we saw a tremendous increase in RSV infections as well as some other infections. Dr. Falsey, you mentioned earlier testing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, and this is gonna be important because of how common RSV is and how it can spread and because certain people can become seriously ill. So for instance, you have a child who has RSV and maybe just a runny nose, hugging and kissing grandma and grandpa well, that, that's a really easy way for RSV to spread. So if you or your child have any RSV symptoms, especially when there's a higher risk for severe illness, uh, people should contact their doctor or their healthcare team member. Uh, getting tested is going to help them determine which infection you have. Is it RSV or is it something else? And then think about the next best steps for you. Because different infections are gonna be handled differently. Uh, to check for RSV and possibly rule out these other infections we've talked about, they may do tests such as swabbing the inside of your mouth or nose or doing blood or urine tests to check for other kinds of infections. They may also decide that performing a chest X-ray is a good way to check your lungs if they're concerned. And then uh, there is something called pulse oximetry which checks the oxygen levels in your blood simply by a small device on your finger. Uh, they would also likely ask you about your medical history and do a physical exam. That's great information, and We really want everyone to be aware of RSV because it can be especially dangerous for some of these groups we've talked about, like older adults and adults who are living with certain health conditions or maybe immunocompromised. And with COVID-19 on everyone's minds lately, we want to make sure that people don't forget about these other viral infections like RSV. 
So if you have respiratory symptoms or think you've been exposed to RSV, again, again, contact your doctor or healthcare team, especially if you're at higher risk for severe illness or around somebody who is. And remember that prevention is much better and easier than treatment. So follow the prevention measures we talked about to prevent getting sick in the first place. Dr. Falsey, thank you so much for joining me today. Any closing thoughts or advice for our listeners? Well, thanks, Greg. It's, it's been a real pleasure. I think that um, we should always learn from recent events. And RSV has been around for quite some time. We've known about it. But we've also learned that some of the public health measures and masking actually works to prevent these other respiratory infections. And so if you are a very uh, elderly person or uh, have underlying medical conditions and you start hearing on the news that there's a lot of RSV around, um, you, you know, you might consider when you're out in public uh, to wear a mask. I think it, it they really work. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic for the future that maybe someday we'll have some ways to truly prevent RSV. And I'm, I'm glad that RSV is gaining a little more attention. This is an important disease. Wonderful. And thank you again. And thank you to our listeners as well.